growing up, it was a tradition in the Kuhn family that on New Year's Eve and on New Year's Day, we would get a puzzle, my mom would select it, and we would put that puzzle together while uh, enjoying some snackage, little Smokies and a crock pot with barbecue sauce, and we'd have some uh, some of those black-eyed peas. My mom is from the South, and got to black-eyed peas on New Year's. And uh, all in all, it was a good way to spend the day. And so when Olivia and I were newly married, got to figure out our own traditions, we, we figured, let's, let's try this. So we got a puzzle for New Year's Day, and we got all our snackage lined up, and it turned out that we were really good at, at snacking. We were really bad at doing the puzzle. <laughs> that poor puzzle, it languished there for days and days. And Olivia actually reminded me, at one point we threw a, a, a tablecloth over it because we weren't ready to give up and concede defeat, but we needed to eat <laughs> dinner. So we put, eventually we shoved the poor puzzle into its box and put it out of its misery. But uh, looking back on my childhood, I can now see far more clearly that what really happened was my mother did a puzzle and we snacked and uh, it was a great way to spend New Year's. <laughs> it's a kind of a bit of irony that having spent this last month thinking about Advent and Christmas through the lens of puzzles, I, I have to stand in front of you and confess that I really don't like them. I, I, I like, I'm, I'm okay with starting a puzzle, but uh, I really don't like finishing them. I, I just leave them. I, I don't ever, they just kind of languish there, ignored. All right. uh, we have so we are today in the 12 days of Christmas. We're in the middle of what's called Christmas Tide. It's the, the season from December 25th to January 6th. If you count them, it is the 12 days of Christmas. This is the time when we are looking at the beginning of Jesus' life. And uh, this time passes quickly, right? Next uh, Sunday, we celebrate Epiphany. The wise men show up. And then the Sunday after that, Jesus is 30. He's being baptized and off and running. And we're almost at Lent. Easter It's all about to, to come very quickly. But, but for right now, here during these 12 days of Christmas, we are attending to Jesus as an infant at that stage where he doesn't know he has hands and then they're hitting him in his face and he has that kind of confused look any infant has when you go, oh, what it's, it's a, I admit, it's, I find it amusing. Uh, that might make me a bad person. And the thing about infants and small children is that while you can ignore a puzzle and leave it to languish and, and just not deal with it, um, that doesn't work. With, with small children. If you ignore them for too long, they let you know about it, and uh, they can become just a bit insistent. It, it, it's this small child that we, we turn to that we cannot ignore um, today. And, and there was a phrase I came across that, that helped me really understand uh, what it means to, to attend to this child. A phrase I came across in the prayer of a fellow named Stan Hauerwas, uh, something essential about what it means for a child to come with, to be with us, God with us. In any child, and especially in this child, there is this amazing combination of infinite hope and infinite patience. In any child, there's this combination, but especially in this one, there is hope and patience that is both combined here. And this is at the center of the, the mystery. We have this word, the incarnation. We actually sang it a minute ago. And it's this big word that makes us feel like we know what we're talking about. It's, it's, it really, it, it's a mystery. We just have a big word for it. God with us. God, fully human, fully divine. We don't understand, so we call it incarnation. But the fact that this incarnation happens in a child, not in a full-grown adult, not in someone already established as a leader, not someone of status, that this happens in the child tells us something about how God intends to work in the world. This combination of hope and patience. Right? If you look at any child, there is always hope. There is always hope for what this child might do, and you don't know what's going to happen next. You just know something is going to happen, and you have great hopes for any, any child. And, and this is uh, what the Gospel of John is getting at. It, it strips away all of the, the usual trappings of the story. Mary, Joseph, um, in donkey, all that stuff goes poof. As John tunnels in and gets to the core of it, where he says that... Uh, this is the light coming into the world. In Jesus, we have the light coming into the world, and you start to wonder, what might you see as you look at this child? What does this child illuminate for us? And showing that I have a small child in the house, as I started reading about Jesus as the light of the world, the person who started coming to mind was Rudolph. Right? Think about it for a second. Rudolph, 
the deer who was born and no one wanted until he was needed. And then San Santa's kind of a jerk in that Christmas special. And, and then he, but then when he does need Rudolph, all of a sudden you need Rudolph to be able to shine through the darkness and the fog to be able to see where you're going. And, and Rudolph and Jesus, also unwanted, shines through the dark. There, there's similarities there. Rudolph as Christ figure. It, it's not something I ever ex expected to say in a sermon. But I think it's, there's something to this. That with Jesus as the light of the world, Jesus shows us something about um, what we see around us, right? It, it tells us, the gospel, the gospel of John tells us that everything was made through Christ. And, and if that is what we see as people who turn to this child, that everyone is made through Christ, can we ever say that someone is totally evil? Can, can we? I, I don't think so. We can say someone has fallen, but I, never think, I don't think we can ever say someone is totally evil, no matter what their faith is, no matter if they've committed horrible acts, even if they're enemies of everything we hold dear. To have, to see by the light of Christ, to see by the light of this child, to say that everything is made through this child, and to have that stubborn, infinite hope that all people are somehow connected to the Christ who made them, even if they do not see and acknowledge it. I think that's part of what it means to see by this, this child. Now, there is, people are often stubborn about not seeing this, that the light of Christ, it, seeing that all people are made through him. And, and so, even as we have this infinite hope for all that is going to happen in Christ, and, and to be clear, we are looking for uh, the reconciliation of all things to, to the one who created it. We're looking for the coming of heaven to earth. We're looking for the end of the powers and principalities, the Bible, biblical way of talking about evil. We're looking for the end of all of that, but we also need the patience that comes with having a child. Because if there's one thing that every child demands, it's patience, right? If you're going to have a kid, you're going to have to learn patience. It doesn't matter if it's my child or whether it's the Christ child. The potty train takes a while, right? You had, Jesus had to be potty trained. Can you just imagine what that means, Jesus had to be potty trained? It had to happen. Mary had to deal with it, and she had to be patient. Yet in the middle of all of this patience, there are always signs of what is going to happen. There are signs of, of what is going to be, that lives are changed, that the hungry are fed, that sins are confessed, that relationships are rebuilt and reconciled. And, and so there are always signs of this future that is to come, but it's not here yet. So we need patience. Even while we have hope for what is going to happen in Christ, we also have lots and lots of patience because it's not all here as of yet. Having a child in the house, I, I saw it described online as a, a toddler is, is an emotionally unstable, pint-sized dictator with the uncanny ability to know exactly how far to push before reverting to a lovable cuddle monster. And that seems both right for small children, and it seems right for our stance as Christians. There are times when the world seems broken and we cannot take any more of it, and we are struggling with our family, with friends, with our community, with life, and we cannot take any more of it until something happens and we say, ah, but that right there, that was the presence of God. That was God's peace. That was God's hope. That was right there. That was the light of Christ, and thank God for it, because the light shines and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are in the Christmas season, a time when we celebrate that a child is born, and so we hold on to both the hope of what the child brings, but we hold on in a way that is sustained by patience, because it takes patience to hold on to that hope of, of, for what is yet to come. Anyone who has raised a child knows this. Hope and patience are combined, because, well, who here has tried to rush a small child recently? Yeah, who here has tried to get a child moving faster than he or she wants to go? And yet, when you do have patience, what amazing things happen when, when you do, right? My wife has far more patience than me with our children, and you know what the, the result of that was? She was the first one to see both of them smile. She was the one who had patience, and she saw them smile before me. 
Christmas season, Christmas tides, a time of this patience for, for the fulfillment of, of our hopes. And so I encourage you to enjoy every moment of it. Enjoy these days of contemplating the mystery of God with us this, in this brief pause at the end of, of, of this year where we got, we're here. We're right at the end of 2014. We're about to start what's, what's going to happen. And we have just this, this moment of, of, of hopefully peace. I encourage you to go home and turn on your Christmas lights. Turn on your Christmas lights till at least the 6th because that's when Christmas is over. Turn on your Christmas lights, sit in front of your tree and just sit. Turn on some Christmas music and just listen to the words of our faith. Wish people Merry Christmas whenever you go out and when they ask, huh? Tell them, we're in the 12 days of Christmas. I'm enjoying this for as long as I can. Tell me about your Christmas. And then just listen. I invite you to enjoy this season of Christmas, this season of hope sustained by patience. Welcome to Christmas. Amen.